Welcome to On Trial, starring Mark Radlich. Radlich. Also starring Sorry. Sean Comer. Sean Comer. Hope you're ready, Hollywood, because you're On Trial. All rise. Judge Harry T. Court is now in session. Judge Harry T. Stone presiding. Tonight on the docket is the 2000 movie, the Nick Hornby adaptation, High Fidelity, starring John Cusack, Jack Black, and Lisa Bonet. I'm your host, the mandated reporter, and frankly, I'm mortified, Mr. Mark Rattledge. And tonight, I'm in the dubious position of defending this thing, but... The man who comes accusing, the man who pointed at this film and said, it's a witch, burn it. Does it weigh as much as a duck? I doubt it. Um, He's about to sell all five copies of Swamp People. (laughs) Ladies and gentlemen, (laughs) he's Sean, you're not. How you doing, Sean? Uh, I accuse this movie of aging like an avocado. (laughs) So... For those, <laughs> for those who hadn't who haven't heard last night's show where we looked at the series starring uh, Zoe Kravitz, real quick, Sean, you came to me with this one. Like normally, I do the schedule and I do it based on what movies are in the theaters right now. But a couple of months back, you were like, "High fidelity, let's murder it, murder it in mm-hmm. bed." Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, wh- where else does the passion come from, Sean? Why did you? Uh, feel passionately about this to come to me and be like, we need to do an on-trial on this. You know what? This is a movie that spoke to me as a massive music nerd in my early 20s and persisted right through my mid-20s and into my late 20s. And it was because, much like Rob, I took a very distinct pride in not just lifting up whatever my tastes happened to be, but also taking an absolute flaming sword to anybody else's sacred cow. I would do so with utter glee in conversation. Um, I I was a terrible, terrible uh, genetic accident, Mother Nature's little whoopsie of mashing together uh, Rob and Barry. Oh, I'm not proud of it. <laughs> and Really, the painful part is is I can see how this is a well constructed story and what it me and what it aims to achieve as far as how you're expected to feel for the characters. But the problem is, especially nowadays with what the interwebs hath wrought, like I said, this thing does not age well. If I mean, if you're the type, if you're the type that has come of age, kind of long after the advent of social media, in you know, in the time of Facebook and twi- Facebook and Twitter and such, um, goddamn, and especially internet review culture, shut up. Um, you know you you could be forgiven for wondering how anybody could have actually fallen as deeply in love with this movie as they did but it was a different time okay (laughs) I mean it was it was a different time and you know 20-something Sean didn't know any better. <laughs> um, I had I had one very particular friend who, yeah, you know, he, he pretty much was Rob. No, you know what? Scratch that, scratch that. Rob, Rob kind of is somewhat redeemable. He was Barry. <laughs> He was he was a skinny pasty berry that looked like he hadn't slept since the H. W. Bush administration. Um, 
and he was every bit the virulently opinionated music hipster that 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 you kind that you kind of see almost glorified here, um, and you know I kind of fell in fell in with him, and to his credit, you know he introduced me to a lot of the music that I that I really adore nowadays, um, everything from Nelly Furtado, David Gray, and Nick Drake to Leonard Cohen, Fugazi. Uh, the Pixies. I remember going to see, um, and you'll know us by the trail of dead with him in concert. Uh, I saw Pete Yorn in concert with him. Uh, very first show he and I went to together was, um, uh, death cab for cutie. Um, just uh, taught me so, 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 so much about the wonderful world of music outside FM radio. But at the same time, as I would realize later, he was just, incapable of just letting people enjoy things and you know I carried this forward and a certain someone very very close to me kind of started exhibiting similar tendencies and it just fed those and it wasn't until later when I met my oft mentioned best friend Scarlet that I met someone who was really who really kind of thought enough of me and kind of cared enough about me to really point out you know, you're really being an asshole and I and as she would often say I only say this because I've seen you be better than that and that was kind of the point where I started to outgrow it and then you know I think I tried to watch it again some time back and this was well before I was ever made aware of the Hulu series and I was just dumbstruck by just how repellent I found the themes of it and kind of reflecting on how again so many people I know you 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 are supposed to see these characters as being kind of loathsome and kind of be relieved when they change and grow even a little bit by the end of the movie but I just found them and I've used this word a lot in the last two days just exhausting just by by about midway through the movie I just I just wanted to ye- to just yell at them god shut the fuck up have an unexpressed thought just let people like things even if you think it's shitty just let them get their little nugget of enjoyment out of it just leave them the fuck alone for fuck's sake but again you know it's it's part of having kind of experience to experience two different times and kind of being old enough to know better. All right. Um, so when we break this down, normally we do a bit of notes. That's your part. I do a quick plot mm-hmm. synopsis, and then we break into our arguments, and then final mm-hmm. words, and then we're out. So hit me mm-hmm. with them notes, baby. <laughs> well, the short and sweet of it is, is the original novel was released in 1995, in the UK by Nick Hornby uh, set originally in London but for the sake of the movie it was moved to Chicago because John Cusack et al the the true believers who were so passionate about bringing this project to the big screen saw a ton of similarities between the vibrant independent and alternative music scenes it depicted both in the source material in, in again in North London and kind of mirrored in Chicago which is a city that they were much more familiar with they kind of knew all the all the proper little hot spots and everything to reference to really lend it the utmost authenticity um it was something that really there was very there was really very little struggle to uh, to bring it to, to bring it to screen. Everybody pretty much once they led the original was like yes yes absolutely count me in when count me in when can we start? Um, in fact, as I learned, I think one of the the two kind of biggest 
sticking points, and I say biggest in that they were actually overcome fairly diplomatically, was um, Cusack wanting to kind of pull back a little bit on how much Rob broke the fourth wall. Um, which, you know, the screenwriters used to used to really convey his innermost his innermost vulnerable sincere confessions um they were kind of taking a cue from the michael from the michael kane film alfie um cusack didn't want to pull back um or rather or rather i should say um you know he wanted to pull back because he he just didn't want the want the movie to be too much of him um but when Stephen Freer signed on to direct it, he wanted to keep it, and everyone else just kind of went, yeah, yeah, okay, we can do that. Um, which, to be fair to the movie, um, if we're gauging it purely on kind of how it how it adheres and really kind of honors the original novel, uh, Nick Hornby later said, later said, quote, at times it appears to be a film in which John Cusack reads my book. <laughs> which, again, he meant with the utmost praise. And the only other thing was, uh, there were there were initially some doubts um, when Cusack and the writers kind of came up with the idea that Rob should kind of have, should kind of have this uh, brief little interlude conversation with Bruce Springsteen. And nobody thought they could actually get him to do the get him to do the film, but they stuck it in the script because they thought, "Oh fuck it, it'll make the stu- make the studio exec shit their drawers." Um, just so happens, Springsteen and Cusack happened to be happened to be kind of sort of buds. Um, he called the boss up. He pitched the he pitched the idea. They sent a copy of the script. And Bruce was like, yeah, cool, I'll do it. Um, And really, that's the gist of it. It was released to pretty much universal praise, Um, including, of course, uh, of course, the soundtrack, which is, you know, of course, spectacular. Um, they uh, Cusack and Cusack and uh, his and and the writers had to listen to a total of about two thousand songs and pare that down to about seventy song cues to actually use in the movie. If it gives you some kind of idea, um, it's currently got a certified fresh ninety one percent on. Rotten Tomatoes, based on a pretty healthy sample of 165 reviews, um, average rating of 7.7 out of 10. Um, It's currently running at a 79 out of 100 on Metacritic, based on 35, based on 35 critics. Um, And if we're going purely by the purely by the numbers on a budget of 30 million dollars yeah it made its budget back it made 47.1 million but then again um i don't think this was a movie that anybody was expecting to be a license to print money <laughs> no I, I i think it was yeah i think it was pretty much assumed that at best it was going to be a critical darling that would that might achieve a, a pretty sound cult following. I'm actually wondering how well between the soundtrack and the DVD sales it did, um, you know, and as far as making this a worthwhile monetary project. God, that's a fair question. That's a really good question. Because you got to remember, you know. I don't remember when Austin Powers came out, but it's always like the the lesson, and sometimes things don't have to be successful uh, on screen. They have a second life in the home video market. 
Um, mm -hmm. And then, you know, that's worth it to keep greenlighting projects, more projects you know, with that character or with that franchise or whatever. So I'd be curious. Yeah. yeah um, John Cusack kind of has a thing for being in movies with great music. Yes. Um, yeah. Um, the, the, the closest modern equivalent I could liken it to would be a friend of mine and I kind of have noticed something similar about anything that Zach Braff is in. <laughs> I, I mean, it, I mean, it might be it might be utter shit on fire, but you can bet it's going to have a good soundtrack. All right. So the quick and dirty. I mean, this is not a complex plot here. Uh, no. We find our titular hero, Rob Gordon, played by John Cusack. Uh, he's in a situation where his girlfriend is moving out of their apartment and he starts to sort of narrate the, uh, the unfortunate events of his various heartbreaks. Um, one of the themes of the movie, one of the running gags really is, uh, the listing of top fives. So you've heard the phrase, your top five desert Island albums, that sort of thing. Top five favorite <coughs> movies, just everything's top five. Well, him and his wor uh, working record store buddies, who are Jack Black, who plays Barry Judd, and Tom Luiso, who plays Dick. Todd, rather. Todd Luiso, who plays Dick. Uh, so, as he starts talking about his, uh, his love life, he goes, these are my top five all-time heartbreak stories. And this is how we get to know this character. And so it kind of goes back and forth between his narration and his sort of trying to figure out where things went wrong with him and Laura, um, who was the girlfriend, and kind of a day in the life of these record store workers. Um, as the movie goes on, Laura keeps coming back <laughs> to the apartment to get more stuff, and they keep talking about their relationship. Basically... Rob wasn't willing to commit to her and he kept drifting to you know, his eyes kept drifting to other women. He uh he'll say later on in the movie that other women are fantasies, but up to this point he kept chasing those fantasies. And when he kind of grows up a bit and realizes that they are in fact fantasies, and he realizes that the person in his life who means something to him that he never gets sick of is Laura, is about when they get back together again. There's a brief thing where they go to Laura's father's funeral um, and they have a bonding, both <laughs> emotional and physical, uh, moment, which is then followed by this conversation. Um, a couple of other B-plots of the movie. Jack Black is trying to get in a band he will eventually be chosen, and uh, that band will first be uh, Sonic Death Monkey, and then, and then Kathleen Turner Overdrive, which is the greatest, which not <laughs> since, which not since John Cougar Concentration Camp have I heard a funnier name. Um, <laughs> oh, okay, you've clearly seen something that I had. John Cougar Concentration Camp. You should listen to what some of the old Metal Hammer of Dooms. <laughs> God, I guess. <laughs> Robert Cooper, we love you. Anyway, um, so yes, <laughs> Kathleen Turner Overdrive, John Cougar Concentration Camp. Hey, kids, if you're forming a band and you want to get noticed, take a celebrity's name and work it into some other cockamamie thing. All right, so <laughs> <laughs> so Jack Black's, you know, um, loud, obnoxious character. He's trying to get in the band. Then there's these two other characters. Um, Two other characters who are stealing records from the store. Turns out they're in kind of a uh, techno project called the Kinky Wizards. And Rob, who is sort of a ne'er-do-well, like flunked out of college, just kind of spinning his wheels, arrested development guy, sees an opportunity with these two kids and, just, and says he's willing to produce and put out their, uh, their album. After he gets back together with Laura, she encourages him to DJ they set up this whole like listening party, release party, where he DJs. They put out the Kinky Wizards album, and Jack Black's band opens up. And it turns out Jack Black's actually a pretty good singer. Um, that's it. That's the movie. 
Your witness, sir. Arguably, the biggest problem that I have with this movie, and it is one that the movie itself really cannot help, is the same problem that I've espoused about Fight Club and also about people who about people who slather their Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram with memes of Harley Quinn and the Joker unironically proclaiming them hashtag relationship goals. If you look to Barry and Rob in particular as hero figures or examples or as the good guys in this movie, you have missed the fucking point entirely. Your obliviousness astounds me. It should come under scientific review as to how someone can be this unaware. Seriously, watch this again with actual mature eyes. There is very little about these two characters in particular to root for, and yet they are the ones that I have seen so many vapid, grating hipsters completely unironically seek to emulate and quote ad nauseum again and again and again please stop get help you have missed the point these are not good people they exhibit very little actual change from the start of the movie to the finish In fact, one of the things I would have to knock most about Rob is that even if internally he's acknowledging a personal evolution and an emotional sea change and some willingness to accept accept accountability for his many egregious fuck-ups, the best of which are are detailed wonderfully by Joan Cusack playing Rob's sister... He really does nothing outwardly to merit another chance, except being in basically the right place at the right time during Laura's most emotionally desperate moment. Fuck me. If not for the fact that I'm pretty sure I'm using this term wrong, you could almost call him a Gary Stew. Jack Black would be right up there as well, except for the fact that there's precious little emotional investment in him, except for the fact that he goes from being an obnoxious, arrogant, abrasive blowhard throughout the entire movie to now presumably being an obnoxious, abrasive blowhard fronting a band with an admittedly awesome name. Points for that. Kathleen Turner Overdrive is a great name. Moving on. But the thing is... And again, this is something that neither Nick Hornby, nor John Cusack, nor Stephen Frears, nor anybody else really could have entirely foreseen, is the movie, when viewed with the wrong, immature point of view of the world, is nothing more than just kind of a glowing endorsement of an early beta version of the kind of elitist gatekeeping that has kind of pervaded so many fandoms and nerd interests nowadays. Because the sad part is, you do see shit like this. It's not caricature. This is a thing that people do online all the time, and it kind of ruins liking things for people. And I know that it wasn't meant to glorify it in the first place. You know, you're intended to look upon Rob and Barry and kind of be, kind of both be annoyed by them and pity them at the same time. 
But it's still something that happens and leaves me with no choice but to kind of resent this movie's existence. You see it everywhere from absolutely dousing people with gasoline over the music they over the music they like to seeing it in wrestling circles god do i see it amongst my gaming peers all the time um i i once had somebody tell me and i i'm paraphrasing this only slightly when i told him that i that i liked bioshock 2 that my opinion was a that my preference was as he put it objectively wrong <laughs> It is the closest I have come to actually encountering Barry in real life. Um, And, yeah, you know, the older you get, you're able to kind of perceive the nuance and kind of see what they're getting at there. But, again, it just... gave rise to so many douchey fuck nuggets who actually thought this was the way to approach people who just innocently liked something who maybe did unironically like I just called to say I love you or for one reason or another had never heard blonde on blonde and the thing about that is, is it kind of pervades the rest of the movie too because when you go back and you really rewatch it carefully, you realize that the movie spends a lot of time kind of building Laura up as being the the sellout corporate the sellout corporate lawyer who went from being cool to kissing the man's ass. And you know, Ian for being the initially preferable guy that she dumped Rob for, might I add, didn't cheat on Rob with Ian, but just got with him subsequently, and they're built up as the bad guys. But then you go back and watch it, and you realize Ian did nothing wrong. Except for having what some people might consider a disfavorable personality and... An unfortunate ponytail. Yeah, an unfortunate ponytail. Maybe objectionable objectionable interests. But what did he really do wrong at any point? Other than start dating a single woman and on at least some temporary basis, make her happy. You know? Um, you, You feel kind of bad for just about every single one of Rob's exes that he tracks down and whose lives he intrudes upon with this need to find closure sometimes a decade or more after the fact um particularly oh god help me out here um which one was it that when rob dumps her because he wasn't getting laid fast enough and she asks why. She absolutely justifiably reads him the riot act. That's number two. About it. Uh, yeah, what was her name? Which one was it? Was that Penny? Yes. Okay, that was Penny Hardwick. I thought so. Um, if you were to post this on on Reddit as an am I as an am I the asshole? <laughs> That's a thing. A, a query. Oh yes, it's very much it's very much a thing, and you can actually find these hilariously archived on Twitter. By the way, um, people uh, and oftentimes with the most appalling stories of their own self centered behavior. Well, yes, post a thread legitimately asking people, "Am I the asshole?" This is a thing, 
if Rob Gordon were to post his list of offenses as detailed in this movie to Reddit, the comment section would fill up with yeses faster than Madison Square Garden packed from pillar to post with Daniel Bryan fans. Hang on. Ah, that's good Red Bull slush. <laughs> oh, we're still doing the drinking game. <laughs> um, it's just, and this is, and this is the problem. You'll point this out to people, and they'll say, "Well, that's the point. You're not supposed to like them," and that's what makes it so damn exhausting is from beginning to end, you just barely get a moment's reprieve from wanting to choke the fuck out of these people. And you're just looking for someone with an arc you can root for. And the closest you and the closest you get is dick. Just because you feel sorry for him for being perpetually browbeaten by Barry all the time. That's just, he, that's as close as you get throughout most of the movie because hardly anybody else has any screen time. Everything is focused on Rob and Barry, and it just gets tiresome. By the time it gets to the redemption arc at the end, you could be forgiven if your patience had kind of been just about worn out by having to spend nigh on two hours with these people. I mean, the ending is, the ending is satisfying, thankfully, but it's a miracle that it doesn't fall under the category of too little too late. Um, which is kind of unfortunate, because I will say, this this movie has, uh, has a surprisingly strong cast. Um, aside from, Ga- from John, you have got... Jack Black just absolutely just absolutely turning Chicago into his own personal scenery buffet. Um, Todd Luizzo, who is a a very endearing, shy guy who was in that thing and that other thing kind of actor, um, an absolutely nuclear hot Catherine Zeta Jones. Um, Lisa Bonet is super charming as a uh, indie singer songwriter Marie De- Marie DeSalle. Um, Sarah Gilbert Sarah Gilbert's Anna Moss has a has a sweet little meat cute with with Dick. They made they make such a sweet couple. Um, Joan Cusack plays Rob's sister Liz. Um, who delivers just about the greatest damn line reading in the entire movie? Hi, Rob. You fucking asshole! Right in the middle of his crowded store. Glorious. Um, uh, Tim Robbins is Ian. Um, <laughs> the uh, Mar- uh, Laura's new martial arts instructor with the unfortunate ponytail and the horrible cooking smells from his apartment. And, oh, yeah, check that out. It's even a very young Drake Bell as young Rob Gordon. So, that being said, the movie's great. The movie's greatest crime is having no idea just exactly what it would beget 20 years later. All right. So, a couple of things right off the bat. I cannot personally hold a movie accountable for the rest of the world misunderstanding it. That's not the movie's fault. Sometimes it is. Um, There are situations, I think, where the hero character, your protagonist, is portrayed a certain way and maybe purposefully so, and so the audience goes for the ride and comes to the wrong conclusions, and that's because of poor writing. I don't think that's the case here. What is this movie about? Yes, this movie is about the love of music, but that's really a backdrop. It's a setting. 
you know, we say things like the city is a character, this is a character. Music is a character in this movie. And to the degree that it, uh, and I'm going to draw from a line from the show, I'm going to paraphrase it, there's this distinction about someone's personality being a collection of things they like versus having an actual personality and just having interest in hobbies and whatnot. And the mark of a good movie, there are some objective qualities. We've talked about them many, many times on this show. But to point directly at High Fidelity, we're looking, with a movie with so little meat on the bones in terms of plot, what you're left with is performance, and you're left with uh, a character arc for your main protagonist. Rob has to get internally, emotionally, from point A to point B over the course of a 113-minute movie. Rob has to learn lessons. Rob has to uh, overcome some internal emotional hurdles. And if, you know, satisfying Hollywood ending, get the girl in the end. And High Fidelity achieves all of those things. I get my adversary's view of Rob as being a twat. Um, I, I get that he's exhausting. But Rob acknowledges that at some point in the movie. And then, granted, it's kind of a rush job. And maybe that's an issue with the craft of the movie. That over the course of a series of scenes uh, at the funeral... And in a few scenes shortly thereafter, where he's sort of internally struggling with whether or not he should have the crush on this music journalist, he comes to realize that it's not about loving music is great, but that should not be you as a person. You as a person should grow to love another person. You should honor and respect that person you should want to build a life with that person and that's where he ultimately lands and the road to get there is is the bulk of the movie i kind of skipped over this in the plot synopsis but let's go back over it he talks about the junior high thing and the junior high thing was he kissed a girl for a total of six hours and uh over the course of a few days and then she went on to uh, be with another guy and she ultimately married that guy so he's kind of off the hook for that one which both in the show and the movie kind of made no sense to me but let's forget it it becomes a non-issue the second one he feels like they're not getting anywhere sexually and he takes that as rejection he's a fucking teenager I'm not saying he's got the right mind he's got the right idea but how many teenagers do how many teenagers have the wisdom to know the right thing or the right way to feel in a certain situation? His horny dick for brains little boy body thought he was being rejected by this girl, and he walked away. Tale as old as time. And then, in case you're like, well, that's no good, and we don't like that about him, as Sean said... She reads him the riot act later and says, no, dumbass, you broke up with me because I didn't want to have sex at 14. Okay. But see, that's craft, right? That's character building. He has a moment where he's like, oh, I'm a douchebag. This is something I should change about myself. So then we go to Catherine Zeta-Jones, who's like, you're unsure of yourself. You were a lot of work. You're not particularly exciting. In other words, you're not doing the work. You're just kind of a moon orbiting around whatever girl you're currently fixated on. If you do the work, if you pick up your share of the relationship, you're a worthy person to be with. Right now, you're not. And he's like, oh, shit. That's like the one, I think, relationship in the top five, quote unquote, that I think he draws a lot of... Uh, a lot of wisdom from so that he can eventually make the change to be 
good enough for Laura. And then, again, so much of the movie is him and Laura working through their issues, which are mostly him being in this adolescent state of mind and having to do, like, a 10-year growth in a 113-minute movie. Which, the question then is asked, well, how well does that movie handle that? Very well. I don't think... I mean, this is a highly regarded movie, critically acclaimed. I think audience scores are fairly high of it. People, I think, get it. Um, one of the accusing statements about this movie is, oh, people just identify with Rob you know, as being sort of a gatekeeper, music, douchebag, you know, nerd. I'm sure some do, m- maybe far too many. But I think there's a greater population of people who are not on Reddit, who have seen this movie and get that it's about a dumbass finding his maturity and locking down the love of his the love of his life. That's the movie, guys. It's it's a fucking romance romance wrapped up in the love of music, wrapped up in a, a novel adaptation. And it succeeds on mostly every level, both craft-wise, performance-wise. Um As I said about the Jack Black analog on the show, Charisse, your your take of Jack Black, I think, is personal. I don't think he gives a bad performance, and I think, objectively, he is what that character needed to balance out the mousy um, dick character. Uh, But if he's too pitchy for you... You know, if he's too obnoxious, whatever, that's a that's a personal thing. That's not the fault of the actor or the movie or the, the screenwriting. <sighs> Lastly, I will say in defense of high fidelity, and I want to go back to my initial point. In development, the people who put this movie out are solely responsible for honoring the material to one degree or another and presenting you with an entertaining ride. This was largely entertaining for for people that saw it. And the fact that it's... Some would argue, certainly my adversary tonight does argue, that its legacy is that people took the wrong message from the movie, that the stuff you like is more important than being a likable person, isn't the fucking movie's fault. The movie is not guilty. The movie did nothing wrong. It is the audience's fault for not being with the movie as the movie was briskly walking along. The fact that the rest of us tripped and fell over ourselves yelling, but the beta band is not the movie's fault. I'll give you the final word. I mean, oddly enough, this might be one of those rare instances in which... I think since well, since this is on trial, where I would probably agree to the equivalent to a plea deal. <laughs> <laughs> Go like, on. <laughs> well, well, like if like I would be willing to acknowledge, like I can't let the movie off entirely scot free. Okay. Or for subjecting everyone to two hours with such with such utterly repugnant assholes. But I will admit that it has its heart, it has its heart in the right place. It cannot help the way its message was absorbed. Just like Chuck Palahniuk can't really help the fact that so many many people really don't get Tyler Durden. Right. The, the the fact that you can't hold Bruce Tim um, responsible for the fact that so many dumb shits who likely also who likely also never read the last the last few pages of Romeo and Juliet um, have decided that they want a relationship <laughs> mirrored on mirrored at kind of modeled after the Joker and Harley Quinn. Um, that is not the movie's fault. And, you know, I would be a hypocrite 
if I held it against people who actually like this movie but manage to not fall into that gatekeeping trap that so many fans of it have. Um, so I guess I would sort of find this movie guilty of, I guess, the cinematic equivalent to manslaughter instead of murder. <laughs> I would be willing to go with that, sure. Yeah, because it's not like it willfully uh, kind of put some uh, kind of put something toxic no. out there. Or, it, it's not celebrating. It's just, it was a good idea. It's not no. celebrating Rob and Jack's in in. Um, Jack Black's behavior is the character and right. the actor. Um, <laughs> 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 fuck. Uh, bah, 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 Barry. It's not celebrating Robin Barry's behavior as saying, these are good things, be like these two ass nuts. Yeah. You know, it's, it's showing you that this is poor behavior and you should evolve. Yeah. It is... It, it is not... It is not the movie's fault that some people just don't get nuance. Yeah. You can't hold that against Stephen Frears, John Cusack, Nick Hornby at all. And there's no way they could have foreseen that, you know, I would be looking upon this movie 20 years later and realizing that it was going to become a harbinger of nerd culture to come. (laughs) Where... You know, if you if you turn the wrong corner in Sin City and say that you write and say that you like what somebody considers the wrong thing, I mean, especially now that we've mutated into the unfortunate thing called cancel culture, um, you could just be throwing yourself to the wolves for any number of reasons. In any. In, and w- without even realizing it, you just like thing, and it's not even sometimes for as val and I and I use the term valid loosely before anybody jumps down minor Mark's neck for it. Um, a reason as how can you like it? That person did thing. Don't you know they did thing? Don't you know that thing hurt people? I mean. We're wrestling fans. We've we've had to listen to this song and dance about Chris Benoit for more than ten years now. Oh, you don't even have to go to that one. They just did this Money in the Bank thing where um, it was done. It was filmed ahead of time at the uh, WWE headquarters in Stamford. And I, I saw it. Yeah, I saw Money in the Bank. Yeah, and so you have like the Jim Cornette contingent of this isn't wrestling. We should not turn wrestling into a Benny Hill sketch. And then there's me and Chris Sheen and many others who are like, this was entertaining, this was funny, this was something I needed in this, you know, in this dire hour right. that we're currently right. living through. I don't give a shit that it wasn't Terry Funk, Jerry Lawler, or Empty Arena. I don't give a shit that it didn't look like a real mm-hmm. fight. I was fucking entertained. So was I. <laughs> um, but that, but to your point. You know, you have the you have this group out there that's like you're not a wrestling fan if you like this sort of thing, and well, you don't get to define me, so fuck you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, precisely, and and that especially goes for it goes for music. There are a lot of artists out there that it is incredible that it is just persistently trendy to loathe. And to absolutely use as an assessment of somebody else's character. I got news for you, folks. I like quite a few of those artists. I happen to think that John Mayer never gets his due as a songwriter or as a guitarist. I happen to really like about the first, oh, three, four Coldplay albums. Um, I will always think that for all of his flaws, yes... Kanye West is a bona fide musical musical genius. Um, Dave Matthews is always going to hold a very special place in special place in my heart. Um, and I'll be fucked if I'm going to accept anyone's judgment for any of that. I'm going to listen to all the cattle decapitation and anal cunt I want because I like what? it. 
You know what? By all by all means. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to say cattle decapitation. Oh God. <laughs> you know, um, I, I I believe you like mindless self indulgence, don't you? I am. A, yeah, so I like them. Okay, one of the one of those bands that even when I first when I first heard them, I didn't quite get the appeal. I don't get it anymore now <laughs> than I do. But you know what? It makes someone else happy. Yep. And that is fine. My that wife, is totally okay. My wife and I don't... I mean, we connect on some things musically. Thankfully, we were able to find a Sirius XM station we can both tolerate. But, you know, if you, you couldn't... <laughs> I, I, I like to tell the story of the first time I took her to a concert. We went to go see Ministry and Meshuga. And, like, the hardest thing she'd ever seen was, like, say anything. So, you know, it was like a culture shock to her. But here's the thing. It doesn't matter that Melissa... Um, I won't do the joke that she likes terrible music. Um, I used to think that, <laughs> that Melissa likes Fall Out Boy and Say Anything and Dave Matthews Band and um, Sister Hazel. And I've seen Sister Hazel now as many times as I've seen fucking Clutch because of that. Um, mm-hmm. None of that matters. What matters is Melissa's a good person. What matters is that right. we, we see each other's point of view on the most important aspects of life. We are, we are together morally. We are together ethically. We are together spiritually. And if she wants to go in the other room and watch Rain and I'm going to stay in this room and watch The Wire, that's perfectly fucking fine because it doesn't really matter. What matters is that when we talk about raising our children, we're pretty much on the same page. Those are the things that matter. And I think that's the point that Rob gets to without being so direct about it. And that's the point of the movie. Yeah, and... You know, from from a practical standpoint, I think about the only justification I can kind of see for why some people hate the music that they do is something like is something like this. And this is a stretch. And again, I'm not saying I I condone this. I'm saying I kind of understand it. Is there was kind of this? There's kind of this zero sum game concept, or at least there was once upon a time with some people where if music that they thought was vapid and utterly inferior in every way to what they liked was getting more major radio play in more places that it was only serving to take time to take you know, valuable exposure away from music that they felt was more artistically worry, worthy, had more meat on its bones, had a little more substance, had more potential to really make you feel something significant rather than just being forgettable. And there was a time I could understand that. Um, a time before you had the boundless streaming options that we have now. You know, when music was so much less accessible, even as recently as during my last couple years of high school, which was, you know, the advent of Napster, the, you know, the the failed piracy service that, you know... Much much like Eric Bischoff did to Vince McMahon, it forced record companies to change the way they did business to the point where now you don't even need an MP3 player. If you have a phone, you have a free music player because Spotify costs nothing. You're going to have to listen to ads occasionally, and you're not going to necessarily be able to skip around songs as much as you want, but you still have a music player. Same thing with Pandora. Pandora is free to use. And if you step up and you pay about $9.99 a month to Spotify, well, then you're really living large. Because if you happen to walk in to a store and they're playing a song that you just can't get away from no matter how much you hate it, no matter how much it makes you want want to just put a bullet in one temple and out the other, 
you can put in entirely unintrusive wireless Bluetooth earphones, click on something you like, turn the volume up, and voila, you have escaped. You're free. You don't have to deal with it. You can create entirely your own soundtrack. Whatever you want to listen to, wherever and whenever you want to listen to it. So, you really have no excuse for just bemoaning that other people like to listen to other things or like other things when you have so much freedom to indulge in whatever the fuck you want. There has never been a better time for independent artists of uh, of any kind. You know, something isn't get, something really isn't finding an audience on network TV. Dollars to donuts, a streaming service is going to pick it up. Movie probably isn't going to do well in theaters. Eh, take heart. Chances are Netflix, Amazon Prime, or Hulu will. We'll grab it, or maybe you can get it on on-demand cable, probably for absolutely nothing, because it's not going to be something they're going to think is worth is worthy of people charging anything for. Can't find something you like on FM on FM radio? Cars will allow you to hook your phone up to Bluetooth and put on Spotify. Even in term even in terms of gaming, Indie developers have so many avenues to get their games out there right now. And often at absolutely ridiculous affordable prices, or even for absolutely nothing, as I learned when I when I got my PS4. And I saw just how much stuff was, was available completely free. There's just no point in wasting the energy. And it's and occasionally I like to impart a little bit of a lesson and I hope it's one that you all take away from this. Let people like things. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay if you don't like what they like. As I've pointed out before, I don't necessarily share the same interests with my family. Point in fact, their interests outnumber mine. That's okay. It's rare we actually have to ask anybody to change what's on the TV or change the music that or change the music that they're lis- that they're listening to. It's rarely ever a concern. And part of that is because I see how damn happy anime makes them. I see how much they love Hayao Miyazaki movies. I see how much they love J-pop and K-pop and what and whatnot. Hell, when we went out to Sonic right before coming over, we even occasionally get to compromise. Shocking as that is, <laughs> they, you know, Carrie wanted to listen to Hailstorm. I fucking love Hailstorm. Just that the song she picked out was, in my opinion, a little bit of a downer. So I just politely asked, hey, after this song, you think we could change to one that's a little more upbeat? What do you know? If you That uh, was all it took. We didn't we didn't even have to swap artists. By the way, for those of you that are, you know, if among your adult, you know, contemporary friends, you're like, ugh, you like this, this is crap, whatever. You have not lived. You have not compromised. You have not experienced. Okay, if that makes you happy, I'm glad it brings joy to your life. Until you have been forced to listen to the kids' Sirius XM channel, because that's the because that's the hill my wife decided to give to my children, and then by virtue of the occasional car ride I have to take with the family, now that I have to deal with, because my kids. Love the Sirius XM Kids channel, and so, and look. Sometimes I think there's like Weird Al Yankovic or some shit on there, or uh, there's an occasionally there's a song that cracks me up. Why is my dad mad at Star Wars? Comes to mind. Um, which if you haven't listened to it, it's hilarious. You know, Breakfast Burrito. Um, 
God, what's the one with the... Oh, I'm a cat. Meow. But, uh, yeah. Like, you sit there and you pick on, like, your friends because they don't like the same stuff as you. You know, wait till you have that fight with your children that you'll ultimately lose. <laughs> so, just get over it now. Get over it now. Learn, 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 learn to let people like things, as Sean said. But here's also another thought. Learn to try new things and understand that just because it's not the thing you particularly like, it's also not bad. Sometimes it's actually kind of fun. Mm-hmm. All right. Yeah. I, I think that wraps it up, so we're going to give this one probation, mm-hmm. yeah? <laughs> yeah. You know what? I- I'll give it I'll give it probation, and uh, you know what? Maybe I'll even – maybe it'll even come up for review. At, at some point. All right. Uh, the next on trial will be in June. Um, I'm dedicating a week to Supergirl. We're going to look at a comic that uh, was written by an award-winning writer. Um, I'm going to get Alexis Haina to watch season five of Supergirl. I don't know if she's going to get to watch the whole series or not, but I twisted her arm into this so that I could actually... I, I wanted to talk about at least one season of all the different CW superhero show, so this was Supergirl's turn. Mm-hmm. We've already done The Flash like two years ago when they did Flashpoint. I, uh, I I have such mixed feelings about Supergirl. You know, I like it a lot. This season's kind of meh, but I liked last season that dealt with the immigration issue. And you know, right, right there, that's it. It's the fact that it has so many moments when it's so charmingly optimistic and endearing and it's it really is it's is its own thing and it's so bright yeah but then sometimes when it decides it wants to do social commentary uh, i it, it's kind of the equivalent of an elementary school child telling you why uh humans are bad and animals are good it's like, all right, let, relax. <laughs> it's so fucking. It's so fucking on the nose. It's a, yeah. It's lacks it, a bit it of ma- the nuance. It, it, it makes me wonder if Greg Berlanti could spell subtlety. No. If can't. you gave him all the con- if you gave him all the consonants. No, but no. Also, no one's watching CW for you know thinkers television. It's you know it's fucking the CW. Okay, no, not an not an excuse, not an excuse. <laughs> right. I. And, and to be fair, I would take Doctor Who to task for the same shit sometimes. Um, either way, we're going to spend that week looking at Supergirl, and then Sean and I are going to do an on trial for the 1984 kind of canonical, maybe not so much, who the hell cares, <laughs> <laughs> Supergirl uh, that came out around the time of the Christopher Reeve movies. Um, I, I, I adore this movie. I think it's adorable. It tries hard to be a movie. Um, Sean's going to prosecute it. He gets the easy job. I'm going to defend it because I am the defender of all things silly. Um, so we'll have fun with that one. We're going to take a break from On Trial for the rest of the summer. Uh, Sean and I are going to do the Purge series uh, when the Forever Purge comes out. Uh, we're going to look at the first four movies. That'll be July 16th. And then in August, we're going to do another Long Road to Ruin. We're going to look at the first two Bill and Ted movies when the new one comes out, assuming it does come out. Uh, you know, let's assume. <laughs> let's pretend. Let's hope. Let's pray. No more movies get moved because I can't take it. You vandals! You have vandalized my schedule. So, um, well, that's... I mean, if we need something to fill the schedule at some point, um, and this is a good time to maybe kind of put this out there publicly, you and I talked about possibly going back and even kind of putting the whole of everything we've already covered kind of back on kind of back on the docket for kind of a sort of a reboot uh, a a long road to ruin repaved if you will yeah yeah we can uh we can certainly look at that all right in the meantime that's what i got going on there in case you haven't heard the uh high fidelity hulu series show that we did last night we did in fact review the high, first season of high fidelity um, myself and Christian had a guess of a time reviewing Money in the Bank. Myself and Pat did the next chapter of our look at heavyweight history. Um, we did the WBA heavyweight elimination tournament from 67 to 68, the scramble for Ali's title. 
Um, Alexis Hannon and I did a comic strip for I Am Not Okay With This. Myself and Robert Winfrey fucking buried Castlevania Season 3. Ugh. Um, next week, Alexis Hannon and I will finish up Shira Season 5. The gang will be all together. The gang, Hey, hey, the gang's all here. Speaking of the Dirk Dropkick Murphys. Um, we'll be reviewing Scoob, which done pissed off AMC because it's going to be a vi- video on demand. Um, <laughs> and then uh, myself and Pat Mullen will be reviewing Season 2 of Dark Side of the Ring. All right, do your plugs and let's get out of here. Uh, plugs are pretty simple. Follow me on Twitter at Comer Codex. Uh, these days, in addition to my random daily rantings and quarantine inspired musings, uh, it also happens to be where I promote my Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash Comer Codex. Uh, it's currently undergoing a little bit of a facelift, so it may be another day or two before I have any more streams up. But for the most part, I play a variety of stuff. Um, getting more story-based games in there, but primarily uh, I like to focus on multiplayer, in particular Apex Legends, Rainbow Six Siege, and uh, coming up in June, the return of Overwatch and probably Dead by Daylight. Um, Where are it's you a good with, time. The, with the Long Road to Ruin video game edition? Have you and Andrew got anything together? Um, yes, we're working on it. Um, the only thing it's waiting on right now is for me to go ahead and finish uh, the first Bioshock game, uh, which I may do. I may very well start doing over the weekend because it's not it's not going to take long. But then once we have that, yes, we also have Long Road. Andrew and I are taking mine and Mark's Long Road to Ruin format and really doing kind of a languorous video game oriented series where we take our favorite game franchises. Uh, play through, if not all of the games, then at least certain landmark titles, just one at a time, and just kind of observe how they progressed in you terms know, of both art and quality. You gonna do the Arkham series? Oh, you best believe we're doing the Arkham series. Well, that's the one I'm waiting for. Oh, 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 yeah, yeah. Four games that I am going to have a whole lot to say about, um, ranging for. Ranging from utter classics that I that I will adore from now until the end of time, to one game that I feel never quite gets its due, even if I kind of understand the criticism, and another where I just look at it and I just go, "How did you fuck this up?" <laughs> All right, um, that's the end of our show. Court is now in recess. I want to thank Sean for uh, pitching this idea. This was fun. It gave me an opportunity to watch and review the show. Um, Like I said, the next couple of shows we do really almost the entire year with the exception of, I think, like Dune. is like all Long Road to Ruins. I just looked at the schedule. Literally, it's all Long Road to Ruins from here on in after Supergirl. So that'll be fun. All right. uh, With that said, this has been On Trial for Sean Comer. I'm Mark Rattledge. Be well, be safe, and behave.